Hello and welcome back to the Crime Reel. Today we are looking at the fascinating but heartbreaking story of Helen Mintix. She was a music prodigy and accomplished violinist who vanished mid-performance at New York's legendary Metropolitan Opera House. The Metropolitan Opera House, which is also known as the Met, is located on the Upper West Side of Manhattan on Broadway at Lincoln Square. This iconic building was designed by the architect Wallace K. Harrison, who was also the designer of the Rockefeller Center and the United Nations Building. It has one of the most technologically advanced stages and is arguably the best opera house in the world. And so, for Helen Mintix, playing at this prestigious venue, it must have been a dream come true. Helen was the youngest of three daughters born to Moritz and Heidi Hagnes, growing up on a poultry farm in British Columbia in Canada. She was a musical prodigy and demonstrated exceptional musical talent from a very young age. She could barely walk and yet would hear a song on the radio that she would then copy and play on the family piano. By the age of eight, she realised that her passion lay with playing the violin, a dream that her parents fully supported. Every week they would make a 75 mile round trip to Vancouver for her to study with her violin tutor, Douglas Stewart. Helen was extremely gifted and during her teenage years, she served as concertmaster of the Vancouver Junior Philharmonic Orchestra and was also a soloist with the Seattle Symphony. At the age of 19, she moved from Canada to New York to study at the illustrious Juilliard School in Manhattan, where she would go on to obtain both her bachelor's and master's degrees. During this time, she spent a summer working as a camp counsellor near Montreal, and it was here that she met her future husband, Yanis Mintix. They married in 1976. Her musical talent took her to perform in Italy and Switzerland before she returned to New York after she was selected to study under the celebrated violinist Nathan Milstein, who is widely considered as one of the finest violinists of the 20th century. By 1980, Helen and Yanis were living on 75th Street, which was less than a mile away from the Met. The pair reportedly had a happy marriage revolving around work, friends and also each other. On the 23rd of July 1980, the Berlin Ballet were guest performing at the Metropolitan Opera House and Helen was part of the orchestra. The programme that night consisted of four parts, Stravinsky's The Firebird, Piazzolla's Five Tangos, Ludwig Minkus's Don Quixote, and Miss Julie by Chur Rangstrom. After the orchestra completed playing Stravinsky's score, they left the stage as the next part of the ballet, Five Tangos, used pre-recorded music. This meant that the musicians had a 45 minute break before they were due back on stage at 9.30pm to perform Don Quixote. Upon the orchestra's return, Helen's chair remained empty except for her treasured violin. Other members of the orchestra were concerned that she had not returned, but felt that she must still be in the building as she would not have left without taking her violin with her. Perhaps she had been taken ill. When the show ended at 11.30pm, there was still no sign of Helen. The police were called and Helen's locker was searched. The clothes which she had travelled to the venue in were still inside, which supported the theory that Helen was still in the building. A search of the Opera House followed, which was nowhere near as straightforward as it may sound. The backstage area of the Met is massive. It is a maze of corridors, tunnels, dressing rooms, workshops and also storage areas that includes 40 staircases and 15 elevators spanning 14 separate floors. It would take until 8.30 the following morning for a grisly discovery to be made. 
Helen's naked body was found on a beam in a ventilation shaft between the third and fourth floors of the opera house. She was blindfolded, gagged and bound, her hands and ankles tied with both rope and her own underwear. Several things were soon established. Helen had been thrown from a sixth-story roof of the opera house into a ventilation shaft, falling somewhere between 30 and 45 feet. The New York chief medical examiner concluded that Helen had died as a result of the fall and that she had been alive when she was thrown from the roof. She had multiple injuries including severe skull fractures and despite her being naked there was no evidence that she had been penetrated. The time of death was estimated to have been between 9pm and 11.30pm the previous evening coinciding with the break and the final two parts of the ballet being performed. It was also noted that Helen's wrists and ankles had been bound with a clove knot, the type used to lash scenery. This, together with the assumption that the perpetrator must have been familiar with the Met's maze-like backstage area, led the authorities to suspect employees of the Met, particularly stagehands who work there. Whilst this assumption may have provided some direction, the suspect pool was still extremely large. A team of 25 detectives were brought in to interview the then 800 plus employees of the Met. Whilst the investigation was ongoing, the Opera House remained closed for 17 days before reopening with a performance from the Peking Opera attended by Henry Kissinger and his wife Nancy and actors Eli Wallach, Anne Jackson and E.G. Marshall. At least on that evening, it was almost as though the gruesome murder had never happened. Unknown to the public at the time, the police were honing in on one particular suspect, 21-year-old Craig Crimmins. Craig, who had an IQ of around 83, had dropped out of high school and had worked at the Opera House for four years. He was known to be a heavy drinker and regular drug user. He had been interviewed at the early stage of the investigation and whilst initially not a suspect, several warning bells soon began to ring. When Craig was brought in for routine fingerprinting, he seemed particularly jittery and it emerged that he had missed his cue and never returned to work after his break on the evening of the 23rd of July. When asked about this absence, Craig claimed that he was in the basement having passed out drunk. At that time, heavy drinking amongst the stagehands was not an uncommon practice. Laura Cutler, a ballerina with the German company, said that she had seen Helen on the night in question in one of the elevators with an unknown man. It was believed that Helen was due to visit the star of the ballet, Valerie Panov, and may have needed help with directions. However, Laura hadn't taken much notice of the man and could not offer a clear description. Under hypnosis, she helped produce a sketch of a white man in his 20s or 30s with flyaway hair. The sketch was at best a tentative match to Craig, but police were convinced that he was their killer. On the 16th of August 1980, Craig was brought in for more questioning. At this point he confessed to being in the elevator with Helen, but denied any involvement in her death. The investigation continued and a palm print that was found on the roof of the building from where Helen fell was a match to Craig. He was arrested for Helen's murder on the 30th of August 1980 and after a marathon interview finally confessed to the crime. In the confession he stated that he had said something to Helen in the elevator which had provoked her to slap him. He then led her up the staircase to another level where he said that he sort of talked her into fooling around. Threatening her with a hammer, he forced her to take off her clothes but was unsuccessful in his attempt to have sex with her. He pushed her along the roof, ripped off her remaining clothes, then bound and gagged her. Craig added that as he was walking away, I heard her pouncing up and down and that's when it happened. I went back and kicked her off. Craig had no prior criminal record and said at the time that something in his head just snapped during this chance encounter between the pair. 
At Craig's arraignment, Manhattan District Attorney Charles Heffernan said that Craig had intentionally caused the victim to fall from a high altitude, causing her death. However, by this point, Craig pled not guilty to the charges. He was denied bail and remanded to Rikers Island, where he was segregated from other prisoners at his attorney's request. Craig's neighbours believed in his innocence, with 29-year-old Phil de Halven stating that he's a sweetheart, he doesn't have a bad bone in his body, I can't see him committing something like that. In pre-trial hearings, his defence team attempted to get the recording of his confession suppressed on the basis that Craig was a man of low intelligence who had been tricked by the police. They were unsuccessful. The case went to trial in 1981 in front of the seven women and five men of the jury. The defence stated that the words that were spoken on the confession tape reflect the effect of subtle psychological coercion by detectives. However, the jury did not believe that and after 11 hours of deliberation, over two days, they found Craig guilty of felony murder. He was cleared of second degree murder as the jury felt that he had not set out to kill Helen, but had murdered her in order to cover up the attempted sexual assault. The sexual assault charges were dropped due to lack of evidence. On the 2nd of September 1981, Craig was sentenced to 20 years to life in prison. When asked if he had any comments, he said that he would like to thank my parents, my girlfriend Mary Ann, and I hope to repay them someday. He expressed no remorse for what he had done to Helen. Helen's father was unhappy with the sentence, stating that, if we had it our way, we'd give him the same treatment he gave our daughter. Appeals resulted in his conviction being upheld, and he applied for parole for the first time in 2000. This was denied, and he continued to apply every two years, with multiple requests being denied due to the severity of his crime. He used his time in prison to educate himself and earned an associate's degree in substance abuse counselling and also worked in the prison commissary. In a 2014 interview, he said that whenever he was turned down for parole, it's always about the nature of the crime, nothing about who I am now or what I've done since then. I could have cured cancer, they wouldn't care. It has been questioned whether the continuous refusal to grant him parole was fair with some believing that the perpetrators of crimes that receive a disproportionate amount of media attention are judged more harshly by parole boards than similar offences that are off the public radar. In August 2021, after serving 40 years in prison, Craig's parole was approved. He is now 64 years old and believed to be living in the New York area. That concludes today's case. Please click like, subscribe if you're new to the channel, and add any comments down below. Okay, it's petty crime time now. Jake from Texas has sent in his wonderful cat, Boomer. Boomer is very well known for playing murder mittens with Jake's feet, just as he's about to go to sleep. And next up we have Midgey Yoon, a longtime friend of the channel, and a wonderful rescuer of cats who lives in the heartlands of America, has sent in her three outdoor cats. The females are Wild Kitty and then Tucky. Stripy Legs is a feral male who comes and goes, but he totally loves Tucky, hence why they're always photoed together. By the way, Tucky has been fixed. Thanks Midgey for sending them in. If you would like to be part of Petty Crime, please send your pictures or videos and email me at thecrimereel at gmail.com. Thanks very much for listening to The Crime Reel. Stay safe. Goodbye. Psst. One other death that happened at the Met included an opera star, Richard Versal, who had just sung the line, You can only live so long. And in 1996, he suffered a heart attack whilst up a six-meter ladder and sadly fell to his death. Goodbye.